Welcome to the Carr and Seguin Show, hosted by Devin Carr and Paul Seguin, where two Michiganders dive into real estate, outdoors, community building, and everything in between. Well, we have uh, there's the episode today is a little differently. Uh, we got Devin in, in the, the cozy of his truck today. Yeah. But yeah, hey, I just we, didn't want to be close to you. Yeah. <laughs> Your face looks better on the uh, the phone camera, right? <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Got a nice glare in the back, so you can't see. Me. You look angelic right now, just glowing. Ooh, fancy word. <laughs> it looks better with a head on in a boat. Right. <laughs> there you go. You're meant to be in a boat, Devin. Yep. I tell my wife that. <laughs> Well, I think we have a very special guest joining us today, don't we? I'll give yeah, you the honors Jack of doing Ford. the introduction, Devin. Yeah, the legend, Jack Ford. Um, he's been a lifelong friend of mine, mentor, even though I kick his butt sometimes on the water. Um, you let him do that? But, well, I'm rolling. Well, yeah. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> it's all up to the roar. Yeah. <laughs> no, but Jack, I mean, anybody that fly fishes or, or, I mean, really in the fly fishing industry knows about Jack Ford and um, the amount of knowledge that he's brought to the, to the industry and just a, I mean, great pleasure to be around for sure. And um, we're all been blessed now that, he has written a book to share all of his knowledge with everyone, even some of the people that aren't able to get in the boat with him and learn from him firsthand. They can learn from him through his book. So, Jack, thanks for joining us. We appreciate yeah. it. Glad to be here. So, for those of you that haven't heard of your name before or know of you, kind of what a little background. Of you. Oh. Well, I guess I started out, but when I was a very young kid, uh, my folks had a place up on the lake near Gladwin. And standing out on a dock one day, uh, I used to watch another kid go out and fly fish. I was only, I don't know, seven or eight years old. He's the one that got me started. But I've been fly fishing for like 70 years, so over 70. I'm 81 years old now, so. and I'm uh, not about ready to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> you look good for that 81. Makes... <laughs> I know. What's all that rubbing he does? <laughs> yeah, Keeps rubbing him in your shape. butt. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not right. a light load, that's for sure. <laughs> right, so I fish for panfish and then pike. And uh, it's all in my book, but uh, fell in love with trout when I was about 12 years old. And, uh, fish for smallies, and musky, and pike too. So my main gig is I love fishing for brown trout. Brown trout? And other trout, too. Yeah. And steelhead, for that matter. How did you stumble on the trout at 12? Was there someone who introduced you to it? or It was really kind of weird, but there was a couple guys... That was close to me uh, on the lake. Older, older gentleman. Yeah, that did a lot of fly fishing. It was uh, kind of freaky because there wasn't that many people that fly fished back then. Really, but uh, one guy was uh, his name was Ziggy Sandvik. Uh, well, the kid's father that got me into it, really, and he he fly fished. But believe it or not, I used to watch more now. They were always talking about trout fishing. They actually used to talk about the river that I learned how to fly fish on, which was the Cedar River. He would he would recommend that people go there to fish. And later on, I got ticked off about that. But, <laughs> um, 
Give it really, your secrets, really, by the way. <laughs> I, I, th- I think Martin F's uh, TV show had a big impact on me. And he was all about fly fishing, right? No, the whole show was about all kinds of stuff. All kinds? Yeah. Okay. They always did talk about Charles Opener and where to go and what to eat and stuff like that. It was an overall sports show. Because there was no trout in the lake. I fished, so finally I, my dad took me over fishing, and my first fish uh, was a brook trout, and I can tell you right where I caught it. Yeah. And uh, as it ended up where I caught that brook trout, a friend, or somebody I didn't know, same age as I, uh, he was from Fraser, Michigan, but his folks had a cabin, like, right on the river, like 20 feet off the river. <laughs> And uh, right, there, right there is where I caught my first trout, and I got to be good friends with him. Hooked ever since. Yep. So he and I did a lot of trout fishing together, and you know, trouted out for a while. But mm-hmm. then I got now, involved. How long? You... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask. So now, I mean, from from a young young man growing up, loving the sport, and now you've. You guide as well. Now, how long have you been guiding for? I started guiding in 1992. So it'll be 30 years next year. Wow. I, uh, a guy asked me, an outfitter, I, uh, my wife and I went to Montana every year, ever since 1973 to fish, fly fish actually. And we took our family because it was always family vacations sometimes too. And I spent a lot of time on the spring cricks actually. And one time I, uh, there was an outfitter there that, uh, didn't know anything about fly fishing really. And he had clients there and he's fishing on a world renowned spring crick called Armstrong Crick. And they were using woolly buggers. Young kid, his name is Seth, uh, come up to me. He was 13 years old, and they were observing that I caught a lot of fish on drive-bys that day. So he asked me what I was using, and I gave him some flies. To make the story shorter, the next day they showed up again. So I asked the father if I could take the kid. So I took the kid, and... Taught him how to dry fly fish. And then that outfitter, that was a year that I retired from GM. And that outfitter come over after the day, and the kid caught about 15 trout that day. Jeez. And the outfitter come over that day, and he says, I hear that you're retired. And would you consider coming back and working for me as a, as a, as a guy? Actually. I had not even thought about that. But I'm retired and I can't fish every day. So I thought, you know, maybe this would be a good thing. So next May, I, April, I thought as long as I'm going to guide in, um, in Montana for trout, I might as well guide for steelhead because I did a lot of that too. So I started guiding that spring. Uh, for steelhead on the Pier Marquette River. And that May, I went out to Montana and did something like between May and September, about 125 chirps for this guy. Jeez. Jeez. I've been hiding in Michigan and uh, Montana since, but I did quit guiding in Montana about four or five years ago. Yeah. That was hard to do because I had clients out there. I had a lot of repeat business. Almost all my customers were to repeat. And, uh, the ones that fished out there, a lot. I did a lot of guiding on the spring creeks, actually, and the river. And after three years working for this one guy, I became an outfit guide. And then I started uh, fishing a lot of different rivers because, I had 20 years of experience out there fishing myself. (laughs) 
So I actually, I ended up guiding on the Beaverhead, the Big Oil, uh, the, the Madison, the Blackfoot, the Missouri, and private lakes and public lakes. And wow. So I took the people, you know, you have, I had the same clients every year, so. Mix it up. Just depends on what was going on, where we went to fish, you know, so. It was pretty nice because I worked for myself. I've been pretty much independent ever since I started. So I just kind of done my own thing. So. Right. That's a good way. <laughs> yep. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's been, I've been very fortunate yeah. in more ways than one, but not just the fishing. I, my whole life I've been pretty fortunate. I, I think that's a dream for a lot of people <laughs> to, to have yeah. a passion for <laughs> what you do and to, to do it pretty much on your, your rules, your way, your, you know, and obviously just continue always to be learning too and, and just telling your clients and showing them and creating experiences for them that only well, you, you really can create. get to be good friends. Yeah. Really. So it's after a while, it's kind of like you're taking your friend fishing and you're going fishing with him. Right. You know, it's, it's really pretty cool. Heck yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so even after <laughs> later years, I even taught him how to net, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I keep telling him, you know, you got to know it all because I'm not going to be around forever, so. You got to right. pass it along. <laughs> yeah. but anyway. So, I mean, obviously, you got the 30 years of guiding experience. I mean, the wealth of knowledge that you have over most people and now you've decided to write a book about it. Kind of how did how did that happen? How did you decide? Well, I'm I'm ready to finally put this into all this knowledge into a book to share with everyone. Well, it's kind of weird because uh, years ago I actually thought if I ever wrote a book, it would be on spring creek fishing because I. I mean, I used to have 100 rods on the spring creeks out there a year. I guided the spring creeks probably 50 days a year. Wow. And plus I fished them. My wife and I used to go out there and fish them, the spring creeks, 14 consecutive days every year. <laughs> so it was really kind of a cool thing. But, uh, well, actually, 20 years ago, I thought about writing a book on spring creeks. But it's pretty hard to write a book when you're on the water all the time. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and when I'm not on the water, then I'm trying to do something with my wife or family or work yeah. or whatever. But I even got it into golf for a while there with my grandson, Micah. And uh, that was cool. But uh, now you're talking my sport. <laughs> so I, don't know, uh, I think later on, yours, some of the my friends have written books. I'm a good friend of Joe Humphreys, good friend of Kelly Gallops. And, I got to be a good friend of uh, George Daniels about five, six years ago or something. And he wrote that book, Strip Set, which is, to me, really a great streamer fishing book. And uh, I don't know, I think George actually, and a good friend of mine, Bob Linsman. Bob and I was talking one day about the books. Yeah. And uh, had a friend of mine that, read some of the books and he says, you know, what's missing is the stories. Everybody's writing these fishing books, but they don't really put you on the river. Hmm. You know, they tell you about it. Tips and tricks and techniques. Techniques and everything else. How to fish, what to use and everything else, but they don't put you on the river, so. The raw stuff. Bob, Bob and I was talking one day, and I said, you know what? I'm thinking about writing a book from a guide's per- perspective on the river. And he and I got talking about it. He said, well, what do you think you want to do? And I says, I think I'm going to do it. And a couple times I almost quit doing it. He <laughs> kept encouraging me to go to George, but... Uh, it took me literally three years to write the book because I'm not, you know. First place, I'm not a big reader. I don't have time to read. I'd yeah. rather make, <laughs> I'd rather make memories than read somebody else's 
Yeah. So I uh, <laughs> I wrote the book in my view, and that's where we came up with the name of the book of uh, the view from the middle seat. If you haven't seen it, so it's a view from the middle seat, and uh, lessons learned from seven, a lifetime of guidance. Actually, yeah. The reason we said a lifetime of guidance, even when I was a kid, or uh, when I worked at GM, I taught uh, I taught fly tying and fly fishing through our TU chapter for forty years, forty right. consecutive years. I think I missed about two years, and a couple of friends took it over. But uh, but basically, I've been kind of helping people all my life. Yeah, mentoring people mm-hmm. long before I even thought about guiding. <laughs> Just kind of a natural thing to do. Yeah. So it's pretty much the whole story's in my book. I heard there's a few pictures of Devin in there too. Yeah. Yeah. Devin when he I looks mean, good a on a boat, bit. right? Yeah, Devin and I right. uh, yeah. <laughs> did, did a lot of fishing together when we weren't guiding. And really and truly, the only time you're not guiding is late fall till spring. We fished a lot of winters together <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. a few days in warm weather too, but we, uh, we caught some big fish. Devin, that, that fish on the fish on the cover of that book was a 27 inch br- brown that I caught when Devin was rowing. Yep. And I, <laughs> and I missed, missed one that big. Right. Like two, two hours later. Remember? Yeah. Yeah, it, it ate my fly, and I missed it. Yeah, so, yep. sleeping at uh, the wheel. Sweet. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I couldn't get that. Th- it actually missed when it was by the shore, and then it went down the river as we went down the river, following, and it took it again when it was way down below. The fly was down below the boat, and uh, I just didn't hook up. A little bit. But I almost had two that big that day. Jeez, and yeah. that was a May day. You remember that? Yeah, oh yeah, I remember. You, you remember who we were following? Yep. Yeah, we're lucky. <laughs> yep, exactly. That's <laughs> you know, and you can talk all you want about what's in the book. Yeah. And there's a lot of good stuff I think in the book. A lot of tips. Every chapter, at the end of the chapter, and this was Bob Lindsay's idea. I'll thank Bob for that. But every every chapter. At the end of it has what I call Jack's tips. So there's a number of tips at at the end of every chapter. That's cool. I like that. Yeah. So uh, some of them are pretty good, you know. <laughs> you think so? Luck, luck on your side is the best thing that you have. Right. I mean, I've caught yeah. a lot of big fish, and uh, it's it's really weird, but. So, a lot of times I catch a real big fish out of the ordinary big fish is because there's nobody on the river that day and they think they're not going to get one that day. <laughs> like the biggest <laughs> biggest fish I caught with a client last year, this guy hooks a 25-incher, uh, Doug, and uh, we land it. It was June 1st. You know how many guys are out there chasing streamers on June 1st? Nobody. None. <laughs> They're all chasing hennies, which I love doing. Don't get me wrong. But the henny hatch this last year was a little, little iffy, I thought. You know, so. And the day before, I had a guy named Mac, Mac McCulley, and McCulley, and uh, he got a 25 the day before that, which is a big fish. Well, that was the last yeah. day. Last day of May, and then I got this guy. Uh, oh, the last day of May, uh, Bob Linsman and I and Mac had lunch in Rose City at uh, All In, actually. And mm-hmm. I was telling Bob about, man, I got this fly that really just seems to be getting big fish. <laughs> and I said, every time I put it on, it seems like we get a big one. Yeah. You know, and he says to me, well, what do you ever take it off for? 
<laughs> yeah, so right. <laughs> the next day, the next day we go out there and I put this same fly on, and I'll be dang, you know, ten o'clock in the morning, twenty five. Jeez. Oh, what was really wild about that day, and I've d- I do some daytime mousing, not a lot. Most people don't even know it works. But I even ran into a guy at a book signing last week that mentioned that he does it. But rarely it ever happens. So I said to this, said to Doug, I said, you know what? You you might as well quit fishing now because your luck is all over. <laughs> you just got a 25-incher, so. Retire. Said, yeah, so I said, you want to try mousing? You know, he looked at me like I was nuts, and then I put a f- mouse on his line, and. Two hours later, we go around the high bank, and he throws that mouse out there and gave it one strip, and here that thing came out from that log jam and sharked that thing, and it was 28 inches. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Holy schmuck. Just a monster fish. And you were going to say no to mousing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you didn't want a mouse, Doug. Remember that? <laughs> but whatever. Um I did quite a bit of mousing in Montana. That's one reason. Oh, really? Yeah. Kind of more some, bigger up there than in Michigan? Or? Well, some, sometimes things work. There's a lot of fish out there, and in some areas. Years ago, there wasn't a lot of fish around. It worked a lot better then. Yeah. Now you got 40 boats going down the river every day. Oh, yeah. And mousing yeah. and a lot of other things don't work as good either. It's hard to catch a lot of big fish or a really huge fish on a day, I think, when there's a lot of fish. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I mentioned in the book is, first thing, if you want to get a big fish, you got to decide where they are. And then you got to decide what day you want to fish there that the traffic might be less. Or the other people, there might not be 20 streamer fishing ahead of you or something. All right. And because uh, it's getting very popular, but yeah, that we got that twenty-five and the twenty-eight on June first. Everybody else, we we got that twenty-five about the same time that everybody else that day to come out to fish the hennies and fish the henny hatch, and then the spinner fall until after dark. We were off the river by six o'clock. <laughs> so. <laughs> My favorite hatch is the Henny Hatch out of all the dry fly hatches. But so my book is basically um, six chapters about streamer fishing. Okay. Um, First six what, from what they eat, you know, the whole the whole gamut all all the way through. And uh, I guess I could name off all, all the chapters, but uh, I don't know if that's necessary. But, um. Gives you the full one for so what they what, you know you think about it. What do you want to learn about streamer fishing? What they eat, how to read the water, the conditions, matter, circumstances, uh, how how to retrieve. I think retrieving might be the biggest factor there is in selling your fly to the fish. Every time you throw the fly out there, a good friend of mine, Tommy Lynch, says what he always says: you got to sell it, mm-hmm. and. Uh, then you got to talk about the streamers themselves. That's the chapter. And then targeting. You know, how do you target them? Where are you going? That type of thing and pulling that all together. And then you got a chapter in there on uh, mouse and one on pike and bass. Then all the rest of them are dry flies. Dry fly chapters kind of start at the beginning where the hennies are. And then the drakes, and then the hex, and all the way through until stoneflies and terrestrials. So, it's uh, the book is unique in the in the fact that uh, most books concentrate on one phase of the game, like streamers right. or like you said, dry flies. But this is this book is about what I do, kind of like yeah. Although right. it's, tell all, it's kind of the the whole thing of the. As far as trout go, this is how I trout. Yeah. I didn't write too much about steelhead or anything else. But, yeah. 
but you oh, also kind of... cover which is which is great in your book about the bait fish all the different kinds which i mean obviously yeah. are a huge part while streamer yeah, fishing over the years and i got a good friend of mine tom drivers and he's written several books but he just wrote a big book on uh actually the a group of guys in New York, or in the East, not New York, actually paid him to write a book on their river about the bait fish and what's in there. Really? So he's kind of a bait fish guru. Does a lot of research. A lot of research. He started writing a book like five years ago, and I think he just finished it. <laughs> but uh, so I talked to him a lot of other people to find out about because I knew quite a bit about bait, bait fish. But uh, I have uh, found 18 bait fish that are basically in Michigan, Midwest. But anything that's in cold water in Michigan is probably going to be in cold water in Arkansas or Montana or Utah or whatever. Right. For the most part. Right. But some of the bait fish that I list are warm water because I also do some bass guiding and stuff like that. So I come up with 18 bait fish, and uh, I do it with a little bit of drawing or painting, not very much. Uh, but I painted three of them, you know, and I thought, hey, they look good enough for my book. And then I thought, wow, I don't I don't have time to paint 18 of these. <laughs> I, I got to work, work on getting the book. So... I took a class one time from a lady in Saginaw, and her name is uh, Jan Farber, Farber, and nice lady, but I hardly knew her, really. And I thought, I'm going to call her up and see if she'll paint. So I called her up, and I says, uh, told her about the book, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I need somebody to paint, paint the fish so I can put them in the book so people can take that as, okay, I saw this bait fish in the river today. What What is it? And they can just go right to the book. Yeah. So they can go to the book, whatever. Yeah. So anyway, she uh, says, uh, you know, well, I'll let, tell me three that you want me to paint. I'll paint them, and then you look at them. So she painted me three, and wow, they really look cool. <laughs> so <laughs> I says, well, I got to know. Because I, you know, I expect to pay you. Yeah. And I'm thinking it's going to cost me a few bills for every one she paints because yeah. it's, it's going to be an original. So she made original paintings of these fish like six inches. And uh, she gave them all to me, by the way. Wow. But I said to her, I says, well, you know, how much do you want to paint all these fish? Figuring it, it's going to be some money. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, Jack. Why don't you just send me a hundred dollars for the paper and I'll paint them? Can you imagine that? Jeez. So anyway, <laughs> uh, I think we're right on this page right here. But, oh, here's the bait fish that are pretty much in the Midwest, but so you can take a look at them. And she painted when all you those. Get the boat. She painted them all. That's incredible. And that's a heck yeah, and they're beautiful. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. So my daughter uh, laid that out. But, uh, oh, by the way, I I had a real good publisher that was going to publish my book, and uh, if I was going to have a publisher do it, it probably would be Jay Nichols, and he and I was getting pretty close to signing the contract, and a couple things I just kind of decided. Like like I guide, I do my own thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I thought, you know what, I can do this, but I don't know how. And I was talking to my daughter about it one day, and she says, Dad, why don't you let me do it? I'm like, no way. Well, she's, my daughter can do anything, really, but she also is a computer. She was a computer program. Okay. And she does mm -hmm. some, some work on some uh, publications a little bit. But uh, so she had to actually get the software that that uh, links up with the printing company and all this stuff. And she learned how to do this software. And my daughter put this whole book together. Wow. Yeah, so wow. Every, 
every page in here is designed by my daughter. That's it's got to be pretty awesome oh, and special oh, for yeah. you. Yeah. Well, it's special for the whole family. Yeah. Because now it's not just me, but the whole family. And to be honest with you, everything my I wrote, my wife has a degree in literature. Thank God. <laughs> and everything I wrote, my wife, my wife looked at it and had a couple friends look at it. And then I ended up sending it to a, uh, a, a, uh, professional editor, which was kind of interesting. Yeah. And she was great. <laughs> I, unbelievable. I mean, she, she made this book even better, a yeah. lot better. Just the and flow of it, probably, maybe? It, it the whole thing. Yeah. You know, everything. I'm sure it is probably interesting, just even, yeah. you know. I mean, she changed it a lot, you know. She made right. it much easier to read. She made sentences easier. She would ask me questions, you know. Oh, some of my uh, sentences will You know, why do you say not. this and not that? <laughs> you know, and I, I, I'm thinking... God, you must know something about fly fishing. <laughs> I mean, she's asking me questions that my people in the boat aren't smart enough to ask. You know what I mean? <laughs> she, read, she read your whole book, though. She, she picked well, up the knowledge right from there. Right, well, yeah. no. Guess what? Her husband was a guide on the Manistee River. No way. Yep. Oh, there you go. And everybody knows him. Tony Petrella. And uh, he was also a rep for a couple companies. Jeez. When I told Mike Schultz down to one of his, or my book signing down there, he says, well, who who edited your book? I said, Kate Petrello. He said, oh, my God. That's Tony's <laughs> Tony's wife. Yeah, yeah. So that's where she was getting all the knowledge from. <laughs> yeah, yeah she, had right. her, she had it up there because yeah. she, she probably listened to him every day, and right. she did right. some fly fishing, and oh, it, it really worked out fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Um, so I, I know you want to talk I mean, a little about the, sh the streamers, right? Just, I don't know if you want to kind of dive in well, a, to a little part of them that you yeah, maybe want sure. to share a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, a chapter or something from your book or way back in grade school. I mean, I couldn't afford to buy flies and back then. You, your parents didn't give you everything. Right. If you wanted something, you mowed the lawn. They helped. You shovel the, out, shovel, shovel snow, shovel snow. <laughs> yeah. and you know. So, you know, I bought my first fly rod. It was uh, four dollars and forty-five or forty-seven cents, or something like that. And then when I bought my second one, I was about fourteen. I actually called George Griffith up on the river. I was on a canoe trip with junior high students, and he had a head and pal. I don't think it was his because I think he used bamboo, but in his boat, they were parked at Gates' Lodge, and I, I got to have that rod. So my dad knew a guy, a wholesaler, so it was like a $23 rod. I got it for $11.97, <laughs> and I can still remember how much I had to save. But uh, I started tying flies when I was probably in the fourth or fifth grade. And my dad made me my first vice, and uh, I never had a bobbin. I used a clothespin that springs, and I used to pinch that and hang it on the thread as my bobbin. Really? And uh, all my materials came from hunting, hunting friends, uh, you know, rabbits, partridge, pheasants. Mm -hmm. My dad had a farmer's where he worked, and... Uh, some of them had peacocks, chickens. So basically, I almost didn't buy any materials for years. Huh. I think I was in my twenties before I ever bought a material. Wow! All my Jeez. all my pike flies were made out of deer tails and stuff, <laughs> just like they make them today, actually. Yeah. But uh, mm -hmm. it, they were certainly not articulated, but. Uh, I can remember extending some by using the snail hook out the back because I kept missing fish. But so I I I, I learned that I don't want to call it the hard way, but this uh, Ziggy Sandvik. I I remember a lot of times like when we were ice fishing, and the days are short, so All right. I'd go two cottages down to his house, and he was really a nice gentleman. 
and uh, his his son would be there, or actually his son was five or six years older than I, so and when I got to like 14 or 15, his son was already in the Air Force, so uh, I would go down there and watch him tie flies, and then I would try to learn from him, but he tied all of his out of the materials that he shot and got, you know, and yeah, and all this stuff. So he actually got me started. But uh, so I tied almost all my flies, and even when I dry fly for stuff uh, in the seventies and eighties, and that. Well, I start teaching fly tying for TU in the seventies. Like my daughter was seventy sixteen. Oh, it would have been 1978 when I start teaching how to, how to tie. tie flies. So, but back then there was no podcasts, <laughs> no TV, no YouTube, right. yeah, no YouTube, no internet. Right, no YouTube. I right. never even saw a book on fishing until uh, a guy gave me a book when I was about 21 or 22. I started working at GM, and he came up one day and handed me a book. Um, Trout by Ray Bergman. That's the first book I ever saw. And it had pictures of flies, but then it was a great book. Everybody ought to have one. But uh, it was a long time after that. It was in the 70s by the time I start seeing books about how to tie flies and stuff like that. Yeah. But, uh, I've always tied my own flies, and they work a lot better than him, but by the way, I, I don't know about that one. You, <laughs> well, you remember that day on the Muskegon, don't you? I don't remember that. Or you I just, just remember the fish. Or you just fished for about 10 days and never caught a fish. <laughs> Devin never catch a well, fish think, now. So I'm just that joking. That was because I didn't. <laughs> but we were going down the river up. that day and we were catching some fish. John Loman and I and Devin, we fished yep. together quite a bit. And we were catching some fish, and Devin wasn't, you know. So Devin was going to change his fly. So I took my fly box, and I threw it back to him. You remember that, Devin? Anyway, yep. he pulls out one of my uh, laser dog. That's what I call this one. It's about that long. And it was yellow with a tan head. I can still remember it. Well, you have a picture yep. of it. Because you caught a 25-incher, like. Five casts yep. later, right? No way. Oh, yeah. Yep. But <laughs> I probably would have caught it, but I was in the front of the boat, and I got my line all tangled around my feet. Remember that? <laughs> so I, I missed oh, yeah. the cast. I didn't even get to cast where that fish was. And he threw it out there. And he threw it out there and pulled out this beautiful 25-incher. Yep. So I didn't even get a chance to throw a strip in there. <laughs> yeah. So... For a long time after that, I kept ribbing them about, you know, maybe you better use some of my flies. <laughs> I think you should. Mm -hmm. But flies make a difference. Yep. But it's not the whole ball game like people think. If you're not catching fish, almost everybody, let's change colors. Yeah. Let's change the fly. Let's do this. I, th I think changing the retrieving technique and where you put the fly is probably more important than changing the fly itself. Do you want to elaborate on that a little more? Yeah, the maybe retrieving? a little bit. A little bit? I mean, some rivers have a lot of sculpins, so you might want to use a lot of sculpins. Right. Uh, here's an example. Uh, where I fish quite a bit below mile, they dump 35, 33,000 uh, planters in there every year. Jeez. Well, what do you think the fish are? Eating. eating the big fish, they're eating planter 100%. And they're all a lot of fish <laughs> four to six inches long, right? Yeah, when they get in there and by the end, middle of the summer or the fall, they're bigger. Yeah, so right. Then you got to use bigger, bigger ones. Keep them so if you go over doing. there and you're fishing something too small or don't look like that or go whatever, after it. yeah, and but other rivers don't have that many planters. Like the Muskegon, I use a little bit different flies. But uh, bottom line is any river that has natural reproduction of any fish 
And they may have suckers. I mean, it's like almost all the rivers have suckers and chubs and right. sculpins and all these bait fish that I got in here. So try to try to imitate something. I think you really do better. Well, right. it's like you said earlier. I mean, you, you want to find out, right? Like, where are you fishing? Right. Know, know what you're dealing with, and then you're going to be able to throw out the right, right. fly to, to imitate to, what they're looking at. I went to Chile, <laughs> and I remember the first time I went there. I went Chile, to the restaurant? No, Chile. <laughs> I'm kidding. The country. <laughs> I took a group over there. We had a great time. Wow. So the first day there... Everybody's the guides are all out there and the outfitters there and they want to see what you got and all this stuff. I whipped out these two streamer boxes with these flies seven to ten inches long. And they looked at me like, Oh, too big, no too big. You won't catch no fish on them. <laughs> you know, so the first day we go to a small river, I don't remember what the name of it was, but I hooked this fourteen inch fish and I'm pulling it in on a dry fly, and here comes this big one off the bottom, and he ate my 14-inch fish. What? And I turned around to that guy, and I <laughs> says, aren't you the one that told me my big flies wouldn't work? This oh, fish so, just ain't a 14-inch. <laughs> right. So we, so we did some float trips, and we fished streamers, and I put them big flies on, and they just... Gobbled it up. Yeah. That's what the big fish are eating. <laughs> right. They, they eat, you know, they want a meal. Your 10 inch wasn't even big enough. Right. You should have brought right. some 14 ers. <laughs> yeah. so, I mean, it's not that you can't catch big fish on insects and other stuff, but. But obviously that proves they're I think going after the big stuff. When, when those big fish get big, they like big things to eat. Right. Yeah, I eat more food as I've gotten bigger. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> well, you don't hear too many people catching a 28-inch round on a... Heck no. But, uh, I mean, I have caught some really big fish on dry flies. Don't get me wrong. But most people do it now. A mouse is a great way to catch a big fish on a top of the water. But on Montana, even on Spring Creeks, I caught some big fish on... On the spring creeks, some came in to spawn and never left the spring creek. Yeah. I remember one time I caught, I was out there and my buddy, Dave Dill, he told me, uh, Jack, he says, I know right where there's a huge one, right below that bush where that creek comes in to the Nelson Spring Creek. He says, you ought to go out there just right at dark. So I went out there and. I got a bamboo fly rod. I used bamboo back then. And I cut my leader way back. So I put a six, number six royal whoop. That's how I got a lot of big fish on dry flies out. <laughs> I put a big number six royal whoop so I could see the wing. It was getting dark, you know. And uh, I cut the leader back. You couldn't even hardly put the leader through the, uh, the eye of the hook on this side. <laughs> and this, this fish... Ate my fly the first drift along that bush. And it was so big, honest to God, I held my rod and I held my rod. My rod kept getting lower and lower. I was I was afraid I was gonna break my rod. Oh shoot. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And uh it broke me off. It broke me off. I don't know how big that leader was, but it broke me off. Jeez. <laughs> but then uh, another time on that same creek, uh there's kind of a dam that goes across Nelson's. There's a pond above it. And one day I went out there kind of early to midge. Most people will go out there later on and fish, kill morning duns and stuff like that. But I got there early to midge because the midge fishing is really good early in the morning in the riffles. And I'm just walking along the pond to, to go out there and I look out there in that pond, and here comes here comes a fish that looks like ten pounds. And it's going up across that pond under the water, but it's still making like a wake. On top. And it goes into this dam. It's only about eight feet wide, but it went all the way across the creek. Yeah, and it like disappeared. So it lives there, right? Yeah. 
So I went out there the next day with a leech pattern. because There's a lot of leeches in that pot. And I waited for that big boy to come back through there. And I, I was ready. I had a heavy leader on and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was all by myself, but I landed that thing. No way. Yeah. And uh, about two years later, Ed Nelson, that's the guy that owned the pot, great people. Uh, he calls me up. He says, Jack, he says, your fish died. No. Yeah. And he, he no. told me, he said, Jack, there's only two people that I know of ever mentioned even seeing that fish, but you're the only one that ever landed. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> they waited. It was 13 and a half pounds. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. It reminds me of like the cash fit, the catfish hunter on uh, Grumpy Your Old Men. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe that was it. <laughs> maybe that was it. Classic movies. Sorry, it just made me thought right. of it. Knowing you're saying only two people have ever seen it, the catfish on her. <laughs> but I right. did that. I did that quite a bit out in Montana, and in Michigan, if just before dark, if there's a big fish out there, I, I just you know, many many times I caught big fish, uh, big brown trout, like on a big size six royal wolf, and I I would Very even use pounds. them sometimes during the salmon because it was just a little bit different, but it fluttered on the water. Yeah. And it moved down the water. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, shoot. So, I mean, obviously all those all those great stories, I mean, you can tie those things in with things in your book. That's the whole point of putting you in the river with your stories, with each yeah. chapter. Yeah. So most of the chapters have, have a story or two. They're all true. Uh, I don't, uh, you know, over the years well, I've you, had I mean, enough good stories. Right, yeah, yeah, you don't need to make But there them. is a couple of stories in the book, you know, where I kind of messed up. There's one story in there where I was fishing with a couple of guys, Harold and Dan, and first day they were with me on, on the river over there. So they wanted to learn a lot about stripping and this and that. And so we were kind of piddling around quite a bit, going down the river and stopping a few times to instruct and stuff like this. And these guys are eating it all up. But uh, it's like a 12-mile float over there. You, you, you know, yeah. and it's starting to get later, so I start picking my spots. Like I'd row, get to a good spot, say, okay, fish, row, get to it. Cause it Hard to get towards dark, you know. Yeah. And I don't like to go out at 8 o'clock in the morning streamer fishing and still be out there at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> so I'm pushing right. through, and we go around this one bend, and this story's in there. And I say, all right, you guys, you know, I'm pushing, I'm pushing. And the guy, Harold in the back, didn't hear me. He throws his fly out there, and he hooks one about, I guess, 22 to 24. And uh, gets it halfway up the boat and it got off. But uh, so then those guys start saying, hey, Jack, you know any other places there's no fish so you can push, you know? <laughs> That's where we want to fish. But I got saved right at the end of the day. A spot where I really wanted to fish came through and we got one about 21 or 22. But nice. So there's, uh, <laughs> for every story about a great fish, there's a lot more stories about not catching crap. <laughs> you know. Right, yeah. <laughs> but every day is a good day. Every day is a good day. On the river. Oh, yeah. And some days you just don't you don't get much. Right. But this spring, this fall, I had one of the best falls I've had in a long time. Really? Yep. All those streamer trips I had, I only had one that we didn't get a 20-inch plus. Wow. So it was That's just... That's great. It's just good this fall. Right from middle of October, I didn't fish for a couple of weeks much because they spawned then. Mm -hmm. Then I started fishing when some of them got off the reds, and it was like every day I was getting one. That's that's always a good feeling. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. And that day that uh, Matt Brissett came, yeah, uh, he was in the back of the boat. I think this story might be in there. And another guy was in the front of the boat. Matt Brissett is a good fisherman, good caster. He 
And he strips like I do in my book. I'm not going to go over all that stuff today, but yeah. he strips a lot, a lot like I do. And it really puts a good pause into your fly. And when you come back with both hands, it actually sets the hook. So you miss less fish too, I think. So anyway, Matt's fishing that way from the back of the boat. He brought a guy with him, and he let the guy in the front of the boat fish all day in the front of the boat. And Matt got three over 20 that day. And the one that's in the book, Jeez. picture of it, he got a 24 or two. And the guy in the front of the boat fishing with a regular strip didn't get nothing. <laughs> so think, things make a difference. Yeah. Right. It goes back to your retrieval. Yep. goes back Statement. to the oh, more matters about the chapter whatever it is on retrieving. <laughs> <laughs> you got to you got to buy it yeah. and then look for it and find yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, right. you know, I I believe in varying my strip even in the same cast. Just depends on where it's at. Coming off the bank, I'll strip different when it gets to the drop off. I'll pause. And then when I want it to get deeper, I'll strip different. Colder, I'll strip different than when it's warmer. You got high water, you strip different than when it's shallow. Well, I mean, you, you got you got to right. I mean, those are all different conditions well, for I, the fish. You go, you go fishing with fishermen, and I'm telling you, you watch them. They'll do the same Even thing guys, no matter what. And they're fishing the same strip, strip, strip every every time. Same, right. never vary. Hmm. I mean, you fish. You would, yeah. I mean, the the, the level of the water is going to change the way they're going to react, and yep. where they are, the temperature, where uh, they are. Yeah, yeah. Yep. you got to do things differently. Well, just uh, keep that in mind. Uh, that's all, all, all part of my book. Yeah, I, I got a question. It, as popularity of fly fishing has grown, when, when two maybe twofold. When have you really seen a huge increase in the the popularity of the 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 sport? And then has COVID had a huge increase into it too, where you've seen a lot more people on the river? Uh, Just because it seems well, let's, like let's COVID go, has really pushed a lot of people outdoors. Let's, let's go back from the start. I'll, yeah. I'll try to make it short. But I used to fish to Pier, Pier Marquette, and the first couple of years I took my family over there. It was. Uh, 10 days every April. I fished the pier market. Yeah. Back starting 1972, I think it was. And uh, I'd fish 10 days and not see a fisherman. Really? Once in a while, towards the evening, Someone will pop one out. guy would come out. <laughs> and Simi Noff, who got to be a very good friend of mine, because he was right in the cabin right next to the one I used to rent for 10 days every year. And I rented that cabin for, I don't know, 15, 20 years. But there was no fishermen back then. There was no pressure. Hmm. It was crazy. I used to go up the railroad track in the morning and fish down to that cabin and uh, never see a fisherman. Wow. So it, over the years, it's changed a lot. But... Uh, It really started changing a lot uh, about the 90s, I think. Yeah. More people. But, hey, I was part of the problem. I had a guy, the first couple years that I was teaching fly tying for TU, uh, we had a seafood dinner one time, and this old gentleman who had a place on the Asabo that I didn't know very well yet said to me, he says, you're that guy that's teaching everybody how to fish, aren't you? Yeah, I'm Jack Ford, and sugar's in. He says, "Well, someday you're gonna res- you're gonna think to yourself, why did I teach so many people how?" <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, the sport has really taken off. Yeah, and for years, even in the '90s, I would hardly see very many boats on on the uh, like uh, the Yellowstone River, mm-hmm. and. Uh, Back then, so I was probably one of the first. By the way, I have the same boat I bought in 1989. No way. Yeah, I've had that boat, well, for over 30 years. What kind of boat is it? 
Laverell, L-A-V-R-O. Laverell, there you go. And it's beautiful on, yeah. on the book because Dave Rumfield painted it. Wow. Painted the skin for me. And, um, <laughs> but now, man, not only is there a lot more fishermen, but there's a lot more boat. Yeah. Well, back, back in the 90s, even 2000s, it was pretty much only the guides had the boats. Right. So what's really made it more difficult, if you want to say that, yeah, is now you go fish a river and maybe one out of five is a guide. And the rest are just fishermen. And the rest are mm-hmm. fishermen. Yeah. I don't take that away from them because, hey, I'm one of them out there too, but the traffic on the rivers today is just un- unreal. Huh. Yeah. The Madison, the, one of the last times I fished it with a client, I didn't fish it actually. I, he says, Hey, I hear the salmon fly hatch is over on the Madison. I said, Well, you want to go over there? No, it's like an hour and a half drive. Yeah. From where I am in I'm Livingston in Montana. He says, yeah. He says, I'd love to. So I turn the car around and we're driving over there. <laughs> And uh, I called my shuttler that I have over there, and I say, hey, I'm coming over. This is Jack Ford. I'm coming over, and I'm going to put in at such and such a bridge because that's where the salmon flies are, right? Yeah, they're here. He says, are you sure you want to come over, Jack? Oh, man. I said, yeah, <laughs> why? He said, well, there was about 200 cars parked at the bridge you want to put in that. Yes. Uh, all the way down the friggin' road. Oh my gosh! Oh. <laughs> Seriously, and this was when? It's a, this was uh, five, six, five, six years ago. That's crazy. So there's not less today. I mean, what yeah. do you think it came from? Just uh, well, more people are enjoying fishing. Yeah, I'm and just trying to it. think like '90s. Like what? What popped in the '90s? Was it the internet? Did I don't know? You know, like. Well, I think. Videos, yeah. I think books, mm-hmm. I think uh, just TV more people channels. teach other people how to do it. More people had classes. The fly shops got classes. Right. TU promotes a lot of fishermen. So does other other group. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, what's what's Mike, not to Mike, love about it, right? You know, my, the first, I'd say the first. 25 years that I taught those classes, I had over 20 students a year. Yeah. You know, so if you multiply multiply that, you know, so I've taught, probably taught in classes, probably over a thousand people myself. Right. Out of life. You think like what percentage of them went and taught somebody else, their best friend, their son. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and more people fish period, you know, walleyes or bass or whatever. it's, It's great. I'm glad. You know, people do. Mm-hmm. A little bit harder to get. <laughs> yeah. A little bit harder to catch huge yeah. fish when it's so saturated you, with yeah, boats. And when you right. first start out, you, you just want to catch a trout. And after a while, you want to catch more. Right. And after a while, you want to try to catch bigger the ones. Big one. Yeah. And when you get to be an old goat like me, <laughs> you just want to try to catch. Big ones. The big ones. Yeah. The trophies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I still enjoy catching a brook trout once in a while and stuff like that. But uh, my main gig is you know, trying to catch trophy brown trout. Yeah. And trying to uh, – it's unfortunate because I probably have some clients who would rather try, just try to catch a bunch of fish. Right. But, uh, <laughs> Your mind's too focused on the big ones. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this story's in there. We uh, we were fishing that that tournament they have out the uh, Rod and Gun Club. You know which oh, one? Oh yeah. Every yeah. year. I had Bill yep. Thomas Thomas and another guy in my boat. I'm anchoring up. I I'm thinking, you know, we're gonna catch him on the mouse. I don't I don't know how it goes, but it's so many inches. Whoever catches this, so many inch, inches of fish in three fish or something like that it was or something like that. So yeah, it was, yeah, something like that. Yeah, in inches of fish. 
Yeah. So my thought process is not to catch 10, 12 inch fish. I want to catch two or three big ones and win. Oh, right. So we started out with a bang and we got two, I'd say 19, 20, 21 inch fish right off the get go. Yeah. And, uh, Bill kept saying, Jack, we got to catch one more little one. So we kept mousing, and I'll bet we had eight or ten more fish eat, and we just didn't connect. So we went in there with 40 inches of fish and came in second place. And some guy that caught ten little ones or whatever it was won the, won the tournament. Yeah. Uh, I think it's... It was. It, it might have been. No, it was the Rod and Gun Club tournament, and uh, I got that story in the book. The bottom line at the end of that story was, Bill. I'm sorry, but I don't know how to catch little. Fish yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I just, only go after the big ones. Yeah, this is not right. my territory. <laughs> well, it's not just, anymore. It, it just kind of makes sense. Well, oh, yeah. Oh, I got two great grandkids right now, and I got two more coming right behind them, but they're going to be six, uh, seven, and nine this year, and they've been fly fishing for a couple of years with me. Nice. Uh, for bluegills. And I have a great time fishing for bluegills, even today. But when I go for a trout, I just soon try to catch a big one. Yeah. Catch a big one. <laughs> Heck yeah. But I love taking them out. It's really fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I live on a little lake, so a private lake. And I can Unlimited take them out. Gills. I can take them out, and they'll catch five or ten every day. Right. In an hour or two, you know. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. So with your book, um, you're obviously doing some signings and some promotions. Um, where you got signing, you already did Mike Schultz's. Oh, so Schultz's far shot. I've done Mike Schultz's. I've done the uh, Nomad Anglers in uh, Grand Rapids, uh, Little Forks in Midland, and Northern Angler. And I didn't get my book okay. until the seventh of November or this seventh of December. Oh, uh, two I weeks ago. Just have a short. Oh well, yeah. Yeah. No. It's it's amazing how many books I've sold online, you know, just on Facebook and yeah. on my website. Mm-hmm. You can go to my website, Country Anglers, www, whatever, Country Anglers, and you can buy my book. There you go. And a lot of people have, and I'm very happy. Yeah. But the response has been. I know, uh, you're holding on to my book right now. <laughs> right. The, 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 re, the response has Can't been, wait to get my hands on it. Yeah, the response right. has been incredible. And I've got quite a few things Lined up. Yeah. Uh, well, at the new restaurant in Baldwin, have you been there at all yet? No, Probably my not. parents were there a while ago. They said it was with uh, it was really nice. Food yeah. was great. Well, they're good friends of mine, and your your dad knows Paul. Yeah, Paul. Yep. Yeah. And um, so January 5th, uh, I'm going to have a book signing there. Nice. But they also, uh, the PMTU, Pier Marquette TU chapter, mm-hmm. that is doing a raffle. Uh, Along with your book signing? Uh, kind of honoring me. They got a raffle going on right now. Very it's, nice. And they got a lot of fly rods and stuff along to go with the, and so the raffle, the supposedly the biggest prize in the raffle is, Going fishing with me for two days and uh, staying overnight at, at a lodge free and all wow. this. And uh, so it's, it's kind of a, like an honor. I'm being honored or whatever you want to call it. So Not gonna, a roast. Not gonna, being roasted. No. Right. Probably, <laughs> yeah. probably should be a roast. <laughs> right, <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> so they're uh, going to draw the winning tickets at the restaurant that day all on, right. on January 5th. January 5th. I think we need to yeah. take a ride, Devin. Uh-huh. And also, Devin, <laughs> uh, you bought a book. Uh, so when you buy a book on, on my website, you can also donate $15 to TU yep. if you want mm-hmm. and get it more personalized. And I just write a little bit more. I'm signing all the books. Yeah, which uh, is very nice. But if you go to my website, 
or even at some of the book signings, the people donated fifteen dollars. And right now, so at, at on the January fifth, at this book signing and raffle drawing. I'm going to hand EMTU a check for $1,000. Nice. That I've garnered from uh, all the donations. From my book sales, from yeah. the donations. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. And, yeah. And you already wrote a check for another TU chapter, too. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't the, you? Uh, when I did the book signing at uh, Little Forks in Midland, people mm-hmm. right there ended up giving something like 340 bucks. Wow. To the TU awesome. chapter, to TU, so I told Bo Rines at the fly shop there just write a check out and give it to the chapter in Midland. Very nice. So they're get, so they got like three hundred and forty bucks or something like that. That's sweet. Yeah, that's awesome. But, yeah, I think. Oh um, well, yeah. And then, in addition to your your guiding career, your your writing career, then you also have your 20 plus club that you've had for a long time as well. Right. And obviously that's kind of on. I started back end of things with COVID, but. um, Yeah, it's kind of weird, but it, it, the real reason I started that 20 plus club, I think it was nine years ago was to kind of give back and, uh, educate people on streamer fishing. Not just the ones that I take out in my boat. My boat's full anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't really want a lot more. (laughs) A few more that if you're really a streamer addicted person, give me a call. Yeah. But uh, uh, so I started the 20 plus club up, uh, I believe it was nine years ago. So I have guests come to my house, show people how to tie their flies, like Eli Perrin, Alex Lafkus, Mike Schmid, Mike Schultz, Russ Madden. So I've had really all the big people over to my house. Like Schultz does the same thing at his fly shop. They call it the Fireflies. Yep. So anyway, I've done the same thing at my house. And I actually wrote a manual that if you signed up for my 20 plus club, Paid fifty bucks, you got the loose leaf manual on how to stream your fish. But, yeah, um, because of COVID, the last this will be the second year now. I'm not I'm not doing it because right. I don't want twenty or twenty five people in my basement. Your house, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Right. You only got to have one bad apple. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got to have one bad apple, and everybody could walk out of there with it, you know. So right. yep. it's kind right. of a shame, but I still have the 20 plus club. And uh, well, hopefully, 2022 will be. And, and this idea came from uh, a guy a guy in Allen Park. Oh, God. It's been 50 years, so I can't think of his name right now, but I actually went fishing with him, and this is in my in my book, too. But. I went fishing with them, with three other guys, and at the end of the day, every brown trout, every trout you caught over twenty inches, you got a pin. Ah. So I came ah. up with that idea for the twenty, 20 plus, plus club. club. I gave pins out for a while, but everybody likes decals. So now, mm-hmm. if you get a twenty inch or a twenty two or a twenty four or a twenty six or a twenty eight. Or a thirty, you, if you want, you can get a decal from me if you belong to the club. Yeah, a lot of people have, but uh, it's kind of fun. But no, it's people great have had the opportunity to Be a part meet of it. these guys and and learn how to tie some streamers from them. You know? Right. So hopefully, if this COVID ever gets over, and I don't think it ever will, I don't think it's going to go away, but. Right. I don't want to get yeah. into that. <laughs> yeah. uh, it would be nice to do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hopefully 2022 might be a little different. I was thinking about doing it, but it seems like it's picked up again. Yeah. 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 Especially in uh, the colder states. Yeah. So we're not going to do it, but if anybody wants to contact me through Country Anglers or my 20 Plus Club on Facebook, 
Um, you know, if you catch a 20 inch fish and you're proud of it, uh, I'll send you a decoy there you go. or a decal. Right, at yeah. Time. yeah. I owe one to Copper, Copper John or what's the guy's name up on the North Branch? Copper. Uh, oh, I can't think of it. Copper. Anyway. Yeah. Have you have you landed a thirty plus? Oh yeah, yeah. Few. What's the largest? Largest fish I ever caught was on the Jordan River. Really? And we didn't back then. We never measured fish. We just weighed them. Yeah, it's true. And it weighed in at sixteen pounds. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> crazy! That's a big a boy. Fish. All right, one, 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 and I never put this story in there, but. Got time to listen to one more story? Yeah. yeah. I went up there with a guy named Bob Nelson. This would have been, wow, way back. Probably around the 80, 1980 maybe. Yeah. And uh, early 80s. So we went up, on, I worked third shift back then. We went up on a Friday afternoon it was during hex season. We hex fished all night. And... The hex didn't come off very well, by the way. And we didn't see a lot of fish. We fished till daybreak. And we had a canoe. Didn't have drift boats back then. Yeah. We took out at East Jordan and the lake. That's where we had our car moved to. We had a friend move our car. And uh, I'm thinking, man, we're going to get a nice big breakfast, and then we're going to go get a motel room and sleep, right? <laughs> Bob Nelson really was an addict about fishing. Yeah. So we go have breakfast, and he says, well, let's go put the canoe back in and go see if we can't get a fish on the streamer. I says, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm about half dead. He says, well, I'll, I'll make a deal with Coming you. Coming off the third shift, right? <laughs> he says, I'll roll. I'll, I'll paddle all day. He I says, all right, let's the river. go. So we go up there, and we're not getting beans. And finally, I put on this pattern about keel fly, where you could throw it out there and really bring it through a hole on the bottom of the river, you know, Yeah. without hooking as a keel, like a keel. And we get to this one bend to the left, and uh, pretty big bend, fairly deep. And we see this shadow shoot across the pool and just hammered my streamer. But the bad news was, and it turned out luck, by the way, the bad news was it hit that fly, flipped it around, and it, the fly bend of the hook actually hooked on the leader. Really? So when I pulled, I missed the fish, never, never hooked it at all. And when I pulled the fly up, so it was hanging upside down. Right. And that rarely happens, but it happened on that day. So we're, we're in a canoe and we're, already past the bend now and bob says ah you see the shadow of that thing i said yes i did he said what are you <laughs> going to do now he says you want to get out and i said no turn this canoe around we're paddling back up river so we paddled back <laughs> up river and stayed as close as we could and we got past this fish i said to bob i said let's just sit here for a half hour just to watch Yep. So we sat there, rested that fish for a half hour. And I was only fishing with like about two X. So I took that two X off and I put that same fly back on with extra heavy tibbet. Yeah. So the fish did me a favor. I think I never would have landed that fish. Oh, right. If it would have hooked up the first two X on, right. And we get down there, I can still see the first time through there. I retrieved it. And then the second time that fly got just about to where it was before, and here came that fish, and then hit it <laughs> just as hard as it did the last time. Only this time I hit him. Ah, yeah, yep. and a sixteen pounder. Yeah, we weighed it, and the, back then it was like a brown uh, brass scale about that long, and pretty expensive scales, and. Mm -hmm. uh, to double check it, I kind of went around the grocery store the next week. And I took that and I kept weighing bags of things. 
<laughs> just, to, just to see if it was right. Yeah, yeah. it was pretty much right. right it was calibrated correctly. Yeah, it weighed 16 pounds, and that thing was like Jeez. probably 33, 34 Jeez. inches. I imagine. Holy I don't know. But it was huge. It did not fit in the net. I jumped. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the only time I ever jumped out of a canoe <laughs> to get it in my life. <laughs> but I jumped, I jumped, I was in the front of the canoe naturally, and Bob was in the back. And uh, we were on the inside bend, so it was shallow. But when I hooked that thing and was starting to fight it, you He's know, we new. were kind of still moving a little bit. And uh, I jumped out of the canoe and actually um, almost like beached it. <laughs> Yeah, there's no way we had, our nets were yeah. short handled about that big you know right yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. so that's jeez Devin what's your biggest 27 I haven't that's hit a, the 30 mark yet yeah that's a heck of a fish oh well, yeah. yeah yeah come on man we gotta get you in the 30 club. I caught a bunch of big fish in New yeah. Zealand though too yeah it was du- like double digits. Huh. Not, not that big. Yeah, that's massive. That's a big fish. That's, that's <laughs> a monster. <laughs> wow. Well, Jack, well, I can't thank you enough for coming on with us. I mean, it means the world. I mean, obviously, we've been good friends for a while, and to see you write this book and it all come and work out and such, I mean, it's fantastic. Um. If somebody wanted to purchase the book, I know you mentioned it before, um, but if you want to tell everyone I a, again. I, ha- I have a website, Country Anglers, and I also have a Facebook, Country Anglers. I also have a 20-plus club on Facebook, and then naturally I have Jack Ford on Facebook and web. and the, I have webs and everything, but the one – to buy the book is the Country Anglers. Okay. So if you go to countryanglers.com, dot com, yep. you can actually purchase the book online, and I've sold as many online right now as I've sold in shop. Nice. Probably more, actually. And, uh, and then, so then we mail it right to you. Perfect. Yep. And then you also have, like you said, you have them in fly shops throughout Michigan. Yeah. And right then, now I, I have... Uh, have have books in uh, Schultz Outfitters, Nomads, uh, Great Lakes, Glenn Black's Fly Shop, yep. uh, Eight and Tackle, eighteen eighty four, uh, Pier Marquette Lodge, Northern Angler, Coin Mountain, Old Old Asabo, uh, Gates's Lodge. Uh, Sable River Outfitters <laughs> and Little Forks and three fly shops in uh, Montana, actually. And Bailey's, Kelly Gallup's, and Wolf Creek. Oh, very nice. So, and I'm going to expand on that, but I just got the books two weeks ago. Right. And I think, <laughs> I think I'm doing started. pretty good. I haven't stayed home yeah. much lately. Yeah, you just getting yeah. started. Yeah. 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 Well, we've mailed out a lot of books that people purchased. Yep. On me online. And the fly shops are doing very well. And I've I've had some great reviews from people that sent me stuff. Uh, I wish I would have thought about it. I could have read a couple of them. But some woman from, uh, she lives in Florida now. Huh. She bought a book from Gates's Lodge. And she sent back a comment to the lodge. Thank you for selling this book at your lodge and putting it on your catalog. She just read it and said that she brings back so many memories. And she said, it's kind of like you're in the boat with Jack Ford fishing and talking to him when you read the book. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's, that's great. It's really pretty cool. And the guy, one of the guys, when I was a kid, the one that I met, on the Cedar River where I caught my first fish. He never did fly fish, so I never converted him. But he always spin fish. And by the way, he used to fish and catch more than I did at the time. Because <laughs> I, I wasn't really good at it yet. I was still learning. Yeah. And 
he read my book and sent me a real nice text the other day. And he says, I wish I'd have read your book when we were kids. Cause there's no way I'd be doing anything but fly fishing. Now. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, oh, that was great. pretty cool. But I feedback I'm getting is pretty, very good about my book. Yeah. I'm excited to, awesome. to get my hands on it and take a dive into your book and yeah, just like picking off of Devin, we appreciate you taking the drive down to come be with us here to on our show and uh, obviously wish you uh, continued success that you've already had in, in, in a little two weeks. Well, thank you very a much. more than that just yeah. uh, since you got your book. So cannot wait to, to dive in and yep. and read all about it. It's been, a, it's been a great time hearing the stories. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I could listen to, I'm sure you have hundreds, if not thousands, <laughs> of many more stories to tell. Um, well, that's the best part about fly fishing is not to catch it. It's the learning. You never know it all. And different people fish different ways, and they all end up with a good result. But the real result that is the most important is a memory. Right. Because they last forever. Yep. Absolutely. It's all about the experience. And I got some with that guy right, right. there. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. <laughs> I got to get him out there again pretty soon. Though. Yeah. Next spring. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. So. All right, well, thanks again, Jack. I do guys. appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. All right, take care of you guys. <laughs> well, hey, another good one. Uh, this will be, yeah, we'll drop it as soon as possible. We'll get you tagged. And obviously, if you guys want to get a hold of Jack Ford or buy his book, like you said, on his website, we'll all be in the show notes uh, to, to be able to get in touch and, and get a book in your hands as well. So I'm Paul Seguin with EXP Realty. I'm Devin Carr with Gold Star Mortgage. And this is the Carr and Seguin Show. See you. Good. The primary purpose of this podcast series is to inform, entertain, and educate. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast series do not constitute legal or professional advice, opinions, or endorsements of any kind. Gold Star Mortgage Financial Group, NMLS 3446, Equal Housing Lender.